Adab, uh, welcome to Decolonial Islamic Spiritualities. Uh, welcome or welcome back, uh, I should say. We've had a gap of a few weeks, uh, but this is still our continuing series, Decolonial Islamic Spiritualities. I'm Noman Nakri. Um, I'm an associate professor here in Karachi at Habib University in the Department of Comparative Humanities. Uh, allow me to begin with uh, a few words uh, about the series. Um, in the action of the University of Exeter's Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies launched a fortnightly webinar series titled Islam After Colonialism. The series charted the dramatic transformations under the devastating global impact of modern apartheid colonial rule in the nature of Islam in South Asia across culture, religion, politics, society, and the arts. In the event, the series received tens of thousands of views per webinar across global regions and groups indicating the extensive public interest in the topic. The decolonial question of alternative pasts and futures was an important part of Islam after colonialism. Given that contemporary concepts and imaginations of history, religion, politics, culture, and ethics remain hostage to the modern colonial heritage. This year, our new series, Decolonial Islamic Spiritualities, while remaining in a similar constellation of concerns and perspectives, extends beyond South Asia, as well as focusing in on the spiritual, ethical, and religious resources and potentialities that have been marginalized or obscured through the co-optation of religion, by colonialism and its inheritor, nationalism. In an increasingly troubled world, decolonial Islamic spiritualities are essential to the conceptual and existential strength of individuals and communities as they strive towards futures that are reparative rather than destructive. And with that, uh, I'll ask uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Sajjad Rizvi, uh, the director of the Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies uh, at the University of Exeter, uh, to uh, introduce our distinguished speaker uh, for today. Uh, thank you, Norman, and, and uh, welcome back to everyone. Um, it's, it's perhaps uh, an interesting thing that our last two speakers in the series this year happen to be um, colleagues at the same place. Uh, so this week we will have um, Iyad Abu Ali, uh, who is a, um, a postdoctoral researcher at the Berlin Institute of um, Islamic uh, Theology, which is at the Humboldt University. Um, Iyad uh, did his doctorate at SOAS uh, on uh, Kubrawi uh, Sufism, and he's, he's published in that particular area. After that, he, he was a postdoctoral fellow at Utrecht on an ERC project on um, the history of the senses. Um, in, in Islam, which, uh, and I believe there are various volumes coming out of it, including translations of, which I think will be really interesting, uh, uh, interesting development. Um, so there he was working on the uh, history of all the senses. Uh, in uh, Berlin, he's working in another area, which I think is quite exciting and interesting uh, developing, uh, which is the, the history of affect, and particularly the history of the emotions. Um, there is, of course, a a well-known history of emotions um, research group at the Max Planck Institute in Berlin as well. Um, and it's, I think, quite an interesting development for how we might want to study the intellectual, cultural, social history um, uh, within Islam. Uh, and in, in particular, how we then maybe use that sort of approach to uh, precisely think about the sorts of resources that Norman was talking about. What are those decolonial resources as we move forward? So in light of that, uh, today, uh, Iyad will be uh, presenting on affect in medieval Sufism, um, uh, rectifying, um, rectifying? Well, I can't read my own handwriting now. Is it rectifying? It's, it's uh, reconfiguring. Reconfiguring, yes, of course. Reconfiguring the body and the soul through the practice of the emotions. Uh, apologies for that. Uh, that's what happens when you can't read your own handwriting. Um, so, uh, without any further delay from me, um, over to you, Iyad, uh, please go ahead. Uh, thank you so much for your kind introduction, uh, Sajjad, and thank you both, uh, Sajjad and Aman, for inviting me to this um, really exciting and really um, very much needed um, uh, lecture series on decolonial Islamic uh, spiritualities. 
I'm just going to get my uh, PowerPoint presentation up. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I, I assume that's uh, all going fine. Um, yeah, um, so, so um, uh, with regard to the study of emotions, um, I'm going to uh, be focusing in this talk. Um, I had a number of uh, things to discuss, but I, I don't know. I, I can't really fit them all into <laughs> this um, to um, sort of one talk. So I'm sort of restricting myself a bit to um, discussions of uh, the concepts of wedged or ecstasy um, in um, in um, medieval Sufism. Um, and I mean that's a big that's a big time period, but um, hopefully it, um, the sort of it, it will show that the focus on emotions um, is an is a and the emotions and gestures, so including the body, the history of the body, um, is a, a useful sort of methodological tool for um, the approach to Islamic studies. Um, but also a useful methodological tool for um, sort of revisiting what um, we've received in terms of Islamic studies from um, scholarship in the past. So in terms of, you know, the colonial and orientalist legacy of Islamic studies uh, and how we, how we might be able to revisit that and, um, and uh, discuss um, both the intellectual as well as the social and cultural history um with regard to I and mean, with regard to sufism in particular but with regard to um the study of islam in general as well so um we tend to think of i guess um emotions as maybe purely mental phenomena uh some that are involuntary um but um as many um theorists and researchers have uh, demonstrated such as uh, monique Scheer, it's it, um it's that it's more that we sort of learn to express and even feel emotions and that's often determined socially and historically um and um so um as i've mentioned emotions are often are usually accompanied by gestures um and these gestures are you know um, very commonly socially determined um, I mean, you can see that even between cultures today, but I mean, and so, I mean, it makes sense to sort of see that even historically. Um, uh, on top of that, um, we have uh, also in study of Sufism, uh, Sufism is often treated, you know, as a, uh, it was often treated as a abstract mystical system of thought. Um, but there are extensive discussions of um, emotions and gestures and the body within Sufi texts, and scholars are very fortunate to have these um, discussions that both theorize what um, emotions are, um, you know, um, and whether that, you know, and how they sort of come into uh, play in terms of um, spiritual states. So think of like hal um, spiritual states or maqam spiritual stations. And attributes of um, that, um, but again, in terms of the scholarship that we received, that there, there tends to be a sort of divide between sort of treating Sufism as a sort of um, philosophical mysticism, which is very abstracted from its often quite abstracted from its social and historical context, um, and then um, and that's all. That sort of research seems quite distinct from. Um, uh, the more the um, uh, a work that focuses on institutions and practice and uh, and uh, and uh, and the more sort of historical research and I think focusing on the body and emotions can really sort of uh, bridge um, uh, these, this divide in in scholarship. Um, so my aim in this paper is to show that um, uh, well I mean this is sort of what I've been working on. So, so slightly preliminary, but I'm sort of getting to somewhere with it. It's to show that uh, affective states um, come to be highly theorized and collectively practiced. Um, uh, and as such, emotional responses um, to sensations and Sufi practices uh, 
began to be placed within a shared context um, that determined Sufi thought and um, uh, be and belonging to certain communities. Um, my other aim in this project is to show that um, we, well, we tend to think of Islamic norms as being constituted in a very top-down hierarchical manner, um, but um, often what we can see in these Sufi texts is that Sufis are um, Sufi thinkers are often responding to um, popular devotions and popular pieties that are occurring in, on the ground, and that these norms are being sort of um, uh, it's it's more complicated. In other words, that they're, they're not being um, uh, constituted in a sort of top-down manner, but in a conversation between um, popular devotions and um, uh, theoretical and um, uh, and theoretical discourse, which is sort of um, responding to them, but also um, attempting to manage them in some way. Um, so emotions not only reinforce particular uh, articulations of Sufi thought and practice, um, they came to be um, determined also by the community and the organizational structures of emerging Sufi institutions. And this affected um, the daily lives of medieval Muslims in general, um, as well as the Sufi communities. Um, and I mean, um, yeah, I mean, types of affective training are even visible today amongst Muslims. So if you think about muharram practices, for example, and um, weeping and expressions of grief, and these, these um, bodily expressions of, of grief can often be hotly contested between Muslim communities um, so that, you know, there, there are strict um, uh, rules about not expressing grief in some uh, other communities. Uh, and likewise, in, in Sufi communities, there's um, a, uh, sometimes an a emphasis on expressing ecstasy um, and there'll be, um, you know, uh, moves against this. And uh, just briefly with regards to how this relates to colonialism, so the subject of this um, talk, uh, the subject of this lecture series, um, it's, it's that, um, as I mentioned, this sort of distinction between um, the abstract um, theoretical uh, side of Sufism and the historically uh, and the institutional and social side. Um, um, it's well, I think much of this largely comes down to the um, scholarly tradition, um, which has been which has been colored by sort of Orientalist uh, discourse, so that um, um, you know, as Sufism has uh, often in the past been or was in the past um, denigrated as a sort of anti-intellectual, anti-philosophical movement that had supposedly caused the sort of decline of Islamic thought and civilization. Um, and in this sense was um, as highly associated with extravagant bodily practices as well as irrational sort of um, uh, systems of thought. Um, on the other hand, um, when Sufism gained favor amongst um, uh, many scholars, um, it was also sort of romanticized and sort of, uh, f uh, you know, the sort of philosophical mysticism was privileged um, uh, in neglecting the sort of, um, to the point that sort of the body and practice and institutions was, was also neglected. Um, so um, this harsh sort of distinction between um, the body and the mind or the body and spirit um, was, um, you know, I mean, this was uh, an essential part of colonialism, um, an essential part of, um, yeah, um, intellectual discourse um, that has characterized scholarship and still does in some cases to this day. Um, uh, you know, early modern European thought um, uh, had this distinction between the body and and the, and and reason, or the body and the mind, um, which was, I mean, and this was uh, as the historian uh, Silvia Federici uh, uh, Federici has um, sort of uh, shown, and uh, this was uh, sort of part of. Um, uh, the part, uh, part of the um, uh, an essential part of how um, European uh, European colonialism uh, 
uh, accumulated capital um, and accumulated sort of uh, class-based control over nature, the human body and labor, and also the subjugation of non-European uh, people. Right? So um, in doing, in sort of undoing this, this harsh distinction between um, spirit and body and mind and body, we can, um, we can try to sort of, um, you know, un undo this sort of tradition that we've inherited. Um, uh, uh, I mean, we can go into that a bit more uh, later. Um, and I mean, it's true, I mean, I don't mean to say that, um, uh, it's true that um, there were trends within the Islamic world that characterized, that had a harsh, set, or, or some degree, distinguished the spirit and the body and saw the body as a sort of, um, uh, and denigrated the body uh, as a, uh, and that um, associated the body with nature, for example. Um, but how, uh, as I will show, um, Sufi approaches to the relation between the body and the soul are complex and continually cont contested, and they're not very, they're not always uniform. Um, and um, often the body plays a very important part in um, conditioning the soul or in expressing the, um, the state of the soul. Um, yeah. So, okay, so I'll turn to um, my examples, I think. Um, so um, Sufism obviously has uh, many terms that um, bear uh, uh, um, that are sort of. Um, okay, so Sufism has a, a a very broad lexicon of emotional terms, uh, um, and these are often um, spiritual states, or and they often accompany um, embodied um, behaviors. So. Um, I mean, one can think of many uh, terms like club contraction, robust expansion, a wedged ecstasy, um, hope, love, uh, huzn, um, sadness. Um, and um, here I'm going to focus, as I said, on wedged, um, because in the early Sufi um, discussions, wedged appears as um, one of the more contested um, uh, uh, sites of, of, of um, Sufi practice and theory. Uh, and this is largely because um, it, it tended to um, occur in audition ceremonies, so some mass ceremonies where Sufis would gather and uh, listen to music. Uh, the, this would obviously be accompanied by um, uh, various uh, bodily behaviors, so screaming, yelling, uh, dancing, tearing one's clothes. And it had associations to, um, uh, to gatherings that were seen as potentially subversive or religiously illicit. So, I mean, um, similar behaviors could be observed in musical ceremonies that, were, um, that involved uh, drinking or that involved uh, female singers, for example. At, at courts, uh, at uh, and um, so this was um, a cause of some um, concern amongst Sufi thinkers. Um, but at the same time, it was one of the primary ways in which Sufi identity was constituted, um, because it was a collective practice of ecstasy that was also um, represented in um, Sufi clothing practices. So. Um, Sufis would often tear their clothes at these ceremonies and patch them back together, and um, therefore um, it was it became this sort of wearing a patched robe became synonymous with being a, a Sufi because the robes would would be torn by um, uh, but would be torn during musical uh, practices. Um, this is different. I mean, this emerges in the texts of. Um, uh, the, early the 10th century and 11th century, so in the Saraj or Sulami and in Sulami's um, works, uh, the Tabaqat uh, and the Luma. And um, essentially, um, this was a, a, a shift, like whereas in the past, they, Sufis were 
um, wearing patched robes due to ascetic reasons because they were renouncing the world or traveling very often or wandering. Um, now patched robes are become, becoming associated with um, a wedge and ecstasy and tearing one's clothes during these ceremonies. And I'll get to that um, uh, in more detail a little bit later. So, um, uh, we can turn to some of these texts, for example. Um, here's one of um, his um, first. Um, so this is from Sadaj's Kitab Luma, and he's discussing, um, he, um, he's uh, presenting a quote by Ibrahim al Khawas, uh, a companion of Al-Junaid al-Baghdadi. Um, and he, um, Saraj includes this to sort of um, divide three stages of hearing. So he says the initial reception of hearing with respect to uh, if that is, um, uh, with respect to hearing the Quran is to hear it as if it is being read to you by the prophet. Then you advance from that stage and it's as if you hear it from being read to, from by Gabriel. And then um, you advance from that stage and as if you hear it from God directly. And this creates three general ranks of uh, hearing. Uh, this is a common uh, uh, quote from Ibrahim al-Khawas and it re recurs in several Sufi uh, texts. Um, uh, these three stages outlined by Ibrahim al-Khawas indicate um, uh, an attempt to sort of stratify different levels of, of hearing at a very early, early period. Um, and um, this was clearly um, related to bodily conduct as well. So um, he goes on um, to say, I mean, this is also about, from Ibrahim al-Khawas, but it's just further in the text, um, but related to the same discussion. Um, and this is in reference to hearing. So the appearance of understanding in your heart um, from what you hear um, from God Most High occurs with the presence of your heart and, the, uh, and your absence from the concerns of this world and your lower soul. Um, through the spiritual power of witnessing uh, mushahada and the clarity of your thoughts and alleviating your concerns and beautiful co co conduct, so husn and adab. Uh, Im and emerging from a state of inner confinement to expansiveness, so from club and confinement to um, bust, expansiveness. Um, and this sort of um, discussion attempts to um, characterize um, states of inner clarity and contentment uh, as being accompanied by a certain form of conduct, husn um, al-adab. Uh, and um, I mean, so these sayings, you know, they're scattered throughout Saraj's um, work. Um, they're not particularly um, uh, highly theorized, um, but if you look through the text, you see that a sort of, um, uh, there's a sort of um, trend of um, stratifying different levels of hearing with affective states and, um, associating those affective states to with um, as certain forms of conduct. Um, so later in the text, for example, um, Saraj mentions the example of the Noon in Misri. Um, he meant uh, saying that he heard some melodiously recited verses of poetry. He rose from his seat and fell onto his face so that he began to bleed from his forehead. Um, Dhul Noon, however, does not feel any pain. Um, but as Saraj goes on um, to discourage these sorts of ec ecstatic states by um, presenting a, quote, a quote from uh, Junaid. Um, so um, Junaid al-Baghdadi says, um, there is no harm in preferring knowledge along with a deficiency of wedged. However, there is a harm in preferring uh, wedged with a deficiency in knowledge. And the truth of this, and God knows best, is that preferring knowledge requires 
the disciplining of the limbs to avoid movement during audition, according to the ability of the listener, until movement comes to his limbs after he has strived spiritually. And it's not appropriate as a kit to attempt to bring about spiritual state and to feign ecstasy and to cause commotion and um, by joining the, uh, the true ecstatics. Um, so that, uh, that is not the etiquette of audition, but stillness and presence of heart and joining in ecstasy along with the listeners according to the inner states is better than joining them by feigning ecstasy. And it may be that feigning ecstasy becomes a habit and that would debase the heart and every heart that is absorbed in love of this world hears before the peace. So um, there's clearly um, a situation that's developing where um, people at some ceremonies are um, practicing emotions in a way, um, practicing the feigning of ecstasy. And um, as Saraj um, brings this uh, quote from Junaid to say, well, you know, um, not totally um, uh, ban this sort of, uh, or attempt to say that this uh, is wrong, but um, say that this is uh, some sort of lower state of um, spiritual exercise, that um, true ecstasy um, is that which is felt, felt and then um, truly performed. Um, but what this reveals is that there are people uh, um, who are attending some mass ceremonies who are behaving in this way regardless. Um, so uh, again, he, Junaid is, uh, this quote by Junaid um, is attempting to um, relegate more ecstatic um, states to a sort of initiate level of Sufi uh, behavior. Um, so Saraj is clearly choosing these um, passages in order to temper the more controversial responses to audition. Um, according to these passages, correct modes of hearing require stillness and composure. Um, uh, but at the same time, we see that things are still being contested and remained contested. Um, later works, um, such as Al Toshedi's Risala, um, attempt to address this potentially controversial aspect of Sufi audition more, ex more explicitly. Um, here, Al Toshedi develops a tripartite distinction to describe the, ex the state of ecstasy using the terms um, tawajud, wajd, and wujud. Uh, and he explains that tawajud it's, involves self consciously performing ecstatic behavior, while wajd involves an involuntary response to sensory stimuli and occurs without effort. And wujud is described by al as finding what one seeks. So namely um, God or fana or, um, uh, and this is above um, wedged. So wujud is above wedged. Um, he then states that ecstatic behavior is the beginning um, and wujud Finding is completion, so spiritual completion, and ecstasy wedged is between the beginning and completion. Um, while the gestural responses um, in the initiatory and intermediate states seem clear, um, so they involve bodily movements, obvious bodily movements. Um, wujud is sort of um, less clear, and in fact, some um, passages uh, indicate that. Um, uh, that questions were put to Kosheri to, in order to understand, well, what is um, wujud? Um, how does one identify it in, in a sort of bodily gesture? Um, and this is one example. So as Shibli was once asked, uh, this, um, so this is in Kosheri he says, as Shibli was once asked in a lecture, does true finding wujud leave any trace upon the people of finding? And he replied, yes, it is a light that shines similar to the light of passionate longing for God, and it leaves a trace upon their forms. So um, it's uh, quite cryptic. It doesn't really say what it is, but um, it, it's clear that there is, um, uh, that it is um, less obvious than uh, 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 moving and dancing and uh, yelling. Um, 
So again, this uh, indicates that more advanced Sufis are not as readily identifiable through conspicuous gestural and affective practice, and that spiritual perfection was thought to involve a certain stillness and composure. Um, the effect of um, al Qushayri's discussion is to contextualize ecstatic behaviors in the framework of Sufi theory uh, and to define these affective gestural responses to sound within a stratified system of Sufi practice. Um, ecstatic bodily movements uh, come to be adopted as important aspects of the effective and kinesthetic training Sufi was expected to undertake, but the Sufi was um, the initiate was meant to sort of graduate from Tawajud to what to to uh, really sort of um, feeling uh, true what uh, wujud or wajd. Um and in this way um, the signif the significance of these bodily behaviors that could be subversive was diminished but they were still tolerated to some extent um, and. Uh, again, this would um, these three general ranks, which again we saw Saraj, uh, three general ranks of listening to the Quran, three general ranks of wedged, correspond to the tripartite a tripartite organization of the human spiritual anatomy. Um, so the the lower rank, which is the nafs, and then the intermediate rank, um, which is um, characterized by um, the, um, the faculties of the, the qalb or the, or the soul or the spirit uh, ruh um, and then the completed Sufi who has annihilated um, his soul and uh, achieved and had sort of uh, has sort of adopted the attributes of God or has um, God um, sort of uh, expresses his attributes through um, the the uh, Sufi, complete the Sufi. Um, uh, and uh, I guess this is also a good point. I'll we'll discuss this a, a little bit later. Um, to to mention that um, in Qushayri's Risala, um, there are also um, affective and bodily gestural um, dispositions that are associated with dhikr, uh, recollection. Which are very different to what um, so um, the kid is um, there was less anxiety about it because it was like a solid solitary practice um, but it was associated with you know sitting rather than dancing uh, abstinence and fasting rather than sort of sensory indulgence um, a more intimate sort of um, communion with god that um, involved visions um, uh, and ocular experiences rather than uh, sounds and uh, music, and often was associated to um, awe. Um, so and um, uh, so, um, yeah, like awe and being beguiled rather than um, wedged and ecstasy. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to that when. Um, I turn to uh, sort of later periods and what that meant for um, Sufi modes of belonging. So um, to move a little bit ahead, because I think I'm, yeah, I'm going a bit slowly. <laughs> um, uh, by the 11th and 12th centuries, um, Sufi thought regarding the emotions um, becomes more, I guess, systematically theorized. Um, so Al-Ghazali's Ihya'ilum al-Din in particular um, facilitated the reception of a lot of philosophical Galenic uh, thought. Um, uh, and um, uh, you can see this in his discussions of emotions or attributes. Um, so for example, in his chapter on anger, Al-Ghazali describes it as resulting from excess heat um, and blood in the body uh, in accordance with a sort of humoral theory. Um, but humans, of course, may overcome this by um, reducing the influence of the nafs, the lower soul, um, and actualizing the attributes of, of God. Um, and uh, he explains that in this way, um, 
anger, uh, which is usually blameworthy, a blameworthy characteristic can be transformed into a praiseworthy one um, when it is God's anger uh, that is uh, expressed through the body. Um, uh, but then that also means that the human is no longer angered by things that Ghazali considers frivolous, for example. Um, in his chat, so in his chapter on on the qalb, um, Ghazali details the relationship between the, the spiritual faculty of the heart and the limbs of the body. And here he explains that desires are located within the heart, while the limbs were created by God to serve as tools to acquire those desires. And he explains that any attribute that dominates the heart, such as anger, desire, or love, will result in the bodily expression of that um, attribute. Um, and of course, the goal of the Sufi is to have aligned these attributes with God's attributes. Um, but uh, you can see that Ghazali is presenting a more um, systematic account of these um, spiritual affective um, uh, experiences. Uh, but um, still, um, there is some... Um, degree of um so Azali still um discusses music um and uh, i mean it's not only al ghazali who discusses um these uh, um this i mean um other sufis as well um discuss the um, emotional effects of music and how that can be beneficial so um here al ghazali focuses on sadness and um uh, says that um, whoever is saddened should listen to melodies for the soul of saddened. If sadness has entered it, has its light extinguished by it. And if it is joyous, its flame is ignited and its yearning is manifested according to the degree to which receivers may accept it. And that is according to the degree to which the receiver has purified himself. Um, so, uh, and this sort of um, discussion of the beneficial in, um, effects of uh, um occur in other texts as well. So um, often, it's, uh, in in some Kubrawi texts, for example, in Baghdadi's he says that if one is experiencing excess contraction, قبض, then requires sama for an uh, to induce a sort of state of lust, uh, expansiveness, and. The and if the reverse is the case, then dhikr should be prescribed. Um, if someone is too much in the state of um, a bust, then they should uh, do dhikr. Um, but um, uh, nevertheless, the role of the body and the sensation is important here. Um, uh, and um, Ghazali also um, refines what we've seen of um, uh, al qushayri um, so um, so um, he has this passage um, which might shed light on what you know qushayri might have meant by saying talk, discussing um, the bodily uh, effects of wujud um, finding the high state of wedged uh, ghazali explains um, if it is asked regarding the movement of the limbs according to nature, in time with meters, melodies, and rhythms, it is said that it is intellectual desire, aqli, and the intellectual desirer does not require approaching the one he desires with extravagant bodily gestures. Instead, he approaches him with a smile, a glance, and a graceful movement of the brow and eyelid, and with allusion, so isharat. And these are all gestures but they are spiritual gestures. However, the animalistic desirer employs extravagant bodily gestures in order to express outward, outwardly his deficient longing. So this, um, again, distinction between the uh, advanced Sufi and the um, initiate is reflected in the refinement of bodily movements and the control of the body. Um, and again, um, we have this attempt to sort of stratify um, uh, 
stages along the Sufi path. Um, uh, interestingly, um, there's an article by um, Karen Khaybar, which I um, looked at, and um, she's also um, mentioned similar discussions, but with regard to um, the Abbasid court and with respect to male and female singers, so that, um, for example, if there was a female singer, um, male listeners, um, it would be more, it would be, um, yeah, inappropriate for male listeners to uh, dance and go into ecstasy and their um, bodily gestures would be more controlled uh, and uh, refined uh, as Ghazali's um, sort of saying. But um, it, when a male listener was listening to a, a male singer, um, it was more acceptable for um, uh, um, uh, 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 extravagant displays of ecstasy to occur within the audience. So um, there, there are interesting um, gender dynamics as well um, going on with regard to listening to music in a, in a, in a non-Sufi context, but here, here you're seeing that in this context, it's very much um, with regard to the institutionalization of, of Sufism. Um, so nevertheless, um, although I've presented some examples where um, uh, behaving or um, taking on um, the bodily gestures of, to uh, of wedged um, while not feeling them were sort of looked down upon, other Sufis and other Sufis contemporary to all the thinkers I've been discussing um, maintained that this was okay and this was a sort of um, praiseworthy thing to do. Um, so, um, for example, um, uh, Al Hutimiri um, in Keshf al Mahdrub um, explains that if one member of the audience begins to throw off or tear his garments, his fellow listeners should do the same in imitation. As mentioned, um, uh, this would be part of sort of the kinesthetic and, and training, uh, affective training. Um, so um, the appropriate response of the audience to one person going into wedged would be the, for everyone to imitate them. Um, and then he goes further and explains that if the if a garment is thrown off without an intention as to who should take possession of it, um, then Fujwiri uh, says that it should not uh, be bestowed upon the singer, but every attendee should uh, contribute a garment so that they may, it may be torn to pieces and distributed among the Sufi members. Um, and so you're getting this um, collective sharing of clothing that represents the collective um, uh, uh, the collective practice of wedged. Uh, uh, other Sufis, uh, Sufi thinkers, for example, uh, Omar al-Suhrawardi had a favorable view of um, uh, uh, people imitating Sufi behavior and wearing the same clothes as Sufis. So for him, um, the, uh, the idea of tashabbuh to imitate um, Sufi, um, uh, Sufi adherence was, was a good thing. <laughs> because it uh, um, encouraged the wider populace to adopt Sufi practices and customs. Uh, and it was a sort of became a sort of acceptable pedagogical method. Um, and these differences between different Sufi thinkers and different Sufi communities often have their own, you know, political contexts and political and social contexts. So for Amos, in Omar Sahrawadi's case, it was um, an attempt to um, uh, create a much more wide-reaching Sufi network. Um, and in other cases, um, uh, there was um, more concern over who had access to uh, Sufi, um, uh, the Sufi institution. Um, for Amr Sahrawardi, there was a close connection between the Caliph in Baghdad and uh, the Sahrawardi community that was around Amr Sahrawardi at the time and um, the Futua organizations, and, and this was all being tied together by, um, uh, by Omar Sarwati's um, uh, community. Um, so um, I don't think I have time to discuss this, um, but I um, will just show you another um, quote from Al-Hujwiri, who says, um, to take pains in sewing patch frocks is considered uh, permissible um, be, um, 
by the Sufis because they have gained a high reputation among the people and since many imitate them uh, and wear patched frocks uh, uh, and are guilty of blameworthy acts and since the Sufis dislike the society of others than themselves, for these reasons they have invented a garb which none but themselves can sue and have made it a mark of mutual acquaintance and, and a badge. So uh, again, um, it's you're getting the um, wedged being displayed in the material culture of, of these medieval Sufi communities. Um, and it's um, not so much uh, the feigning ecstasy, which is um, a problem, but it's the um, people attempting to pass as Sufis and these patched frocks distinguish um, true Sufis from, from non-Sufis in, in that actually this case. Um, and this uh, brings me to um, later developments with respect um, to clothing. Um, before, I, before I move on to that, I just want to show one slide, which is this image um, of a sama ceremony. I mean, this is a much later image, but you can see here um, in the middle clothes being thrown. Um, so, and you can see that the more extreme ecstatic states are at the bottom of the picture and sort of uh, in the middle as well, there's a, a dancing going on, um, but not falling over. And then at the top, you see a more composed um, station of the um, Sufi masters. Um, so again, you're getting this um, stratification of the Sufi um, community. Um, okay, so before I move on to that, I just I need to introduce um, uh, the so um, in later periods, uh, modes of investiture change and adapt in other ways. In in Kubrawi Sufism, for example, former affiliation to the Sufi community is restricted to those who are given robes by Sufi masters directly. Um, the Kubrawi Sufis um, sort of appear in the uh, well, they, we should call them proto Kubrawiya. Um, or um, early Kubrawi communities, which uh, which appeared around um, Najmadim Kubra in Khorasan and in Iran um, in the 13th century. Um, so Najmadim Kubra died in 1220, um, uh, and he um, the, the the school was a very influential school, uh, presided over the conversion of a certain Mongol rulers um, after the Mongol invasions. Um, but also um, during Kubra's time, many um, there was a collection of uh, thinkers that um, came from Najmuddin Kubra's circle, um, his students, etc. Um, so, in these communities, it seems that investiture was a more formalized um, uh, uh, system. Uh, robes were transferred from master to disciple after the disciple had uh, completed a successful course of dhikr. Um, and a discussion with what to do with a torn garment during audition for is, is almost absent from most Kubra resources. Um, so this idea of tashabbu isn't even um, discussed. Uh, instead, um, it seems that uh, robes were um, true affiliation was, was was passed down through the successful completion of, of Likr. Um, uh, one of Najmuddin Kubra's uh, students, uh, Najmuddin al-Baghdadi, uh, employs the term libas with respect to both physical textile, which one drapes around their body, but also the bodily expression of the soul's attributes. Um, and so the emotions themselves are libas, uh, a type of libas um, that are expressed through um, the body. Um, and this equivalence between sifat attributes and clothing uh, crafts a close association between spiritual affective states and, and clothing practices, of course, because the same word is, is um, the same concept um, includes both, right? So in Kubrawi Sufism, um, dhikr was understood to be a synesthetic experience whereby a sensation of the visible colored lights that people would, um, that Kubrawis would see in their visions um, would um, 
indicate the stage of the soul um, and these are sort of colored hierarchies so that the initiates um, were saw dark colors like a blue um, and um, advanced Sufis or completed Sufis saw colorless lights like black or, or white. Um, and this is seen in, uh, in one of Majdeddin Baghdadi's quotes. It has been the custom of the seekers to wear clothes colored with the colors of the lights of the visions that they see for each faculty of the faculty of the human being if it has been sweetened with the sweetness of worship has a specific light to it. Uh, and this is an example of a blue robe of initiation from the 16th and 17th century. Um, so again, this is sort of, um, well, this, uh, not again, but um, uh, it, it seems that in the Kubrawi Sufi community, there was a move away from wedged and sama audition as the primary way through which one's affiliation and belonging to the Sufi community was constituted. Um, and instead of being a collective um, shared uh, affective state that was um, being practiced by the entire community and resulting in the exchange of clothing from one community member to another, it was um, more top-down um, hierarchical um, and uh, centralized around the Sufi uh, master. Um, and uh, uh, so, but um, nevertheless, um, emotions and affect are still important. So affective, affective states are described in dream and visionary journals produced in this period. Uh, in, into initiates and intermediates often report moments of bliss, joy, grief, or confusion, and they discuss their own bodies in, in this. So, for example, uh, in uh, Saif al-Din al bakharzis dream texts, um, one of Najmuddin's students' disciples, he discusses a, a dream he had with his teacher, and he says, well, I looked into my chest, and I looked at my heart, and it had, it had eyes and ears and, um, and a mouth. And, um, and it, it was like a cat's eyes and a bird's mouth. Um, and it was forming in the, at the same time that I was. And then he, he mentions that um, uh, he felt um, content in that, in that, in that, uh, in that state. And in other dreams, um, they, the attention to affect and emotion is, is clearly visible. So um, uh, in other dreams where, where um, it's uh, more disturbing imagery occurs, um, they mention, these Sufis will mention that they've been scared or, um, or, or um, are confused or, um, yeah. Um, and um, what these texts also do is they, um, uh, they contextualize these affective states within wider Sufi theoretical discourse. Um, but I don't have, I mean, I wanted to include much more on, on dream interpretation, um, but I, I don't think I have the time because um, I'm almost an hour in. So I'll just um, wrap up uh, very briefly. Um, so, So what we can see from what I've presented is that um, emotions, gestures, and the body were highly contested areas of Sufi thought. Sufi thinkers rightly identified them as practices that fostered belonging and a sense of community. Um, this is obvious both in theoretical discussions um, as well as discussions concerning the practice, uh, practice and institutional structures. Um, but as we can see, focus on emotions um, can move us beyond the sort of top-down focus that we've seen um, in uh, much of scholarship, the a narrative of a sort of um, elite dictating what theory and practice is. Um, instead, we can recognize a more complicated picture where theory and practice um, was continually um, being constituted in conversation um, and was continually being contested between um, uh, Sufis and Sufi thinkers, 
as well as lay people who are attending um, so po very popular Sufi uh, ceremonies. Um, and um, this can help us look at sort of um, many of the genres and um, figures that have sort of been uh, ignored or um, not received much scholarly attention because they haven't, because um, they might have been um, considered irrelevant to the study of Sufism in the past or uh, considered, um, yeah, um, less valuable texts. Um, but as we can see, um, even things like tra training manuals, dream interpretations, and um, uh, and uh, hag hagiographical accounts um, reveal much about um, the way in which Sufi thought is being formed and the way in which Sufi communities are being um, formed as well. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you so much for that uh, really fascinating um, presentation. Uh, so much to think about. Um, I was going to, uh, I, have a, I have a few questions. Uh, I mean, so um, the, the gesture, I mean, I'm thinking about this transition from uh, Tawajjud to uh, uh, Waj to Wajud. Yeah? So um, the gesture, uh, you know, is, is furtive. Yeah. Um, and ephemeral, whereas um, uh, the uh, uh, whereas comportment uh, is more permanent, uh, um, and uh, so I, I would think of this uh, transition uh, from precisely uh, a more ephemeral uh, experience of ecstasy uh, to a more permanent embodied, existentially embodied comportment, uh, where, uh, of course, it lies, uh, you know, beyond uh, ecstasy or ecstasy is a permanent condition, but there's something, um, uh, ecstasy becomes a permanent condition. I mean, that's how I imagine, you know, uh, imams to be, for instance, uh, you know, in a permanently ecstatic state, um, which is just an existentially embodied, because obviously they're permanently, vertically, uh, in tune, yeah. Um, so, and you know, this other thing that you talked about, the uh, the quote from Al Shibli, which I thought was really uh, beautiful, uh, that it's a, a kind of uh, luminosity. Yeah, I mean, it, it also explains how. Um, well, I don't know about the word "explain." Is I don't know if the word "explain" is the best. How you know when uh, there are these famous encounters, yeah, between Sufis. Um, in which nothing is said, uh, but they each understand each other's uh, condition, yeah, um, or st or stature rather, uh, understand one stature. Stature again is like a, simultaneously a bodily and a, um, vertical uh, word, yeah. It has both uh, the bodily and the spiritual uh, uh, element to it. So the, these uh, you know silent encounters. Um, uh, I can think of, you know, several examples uh, between Sufis in which each uh, uh, manages to uh, recognize uh, exactly the other's uh, stature uh, or condition. Um, and I mean, I, I should think that, uh, in, in fact, you know, um, the body is precisely transformed in that way. You know, it's a kind of sculpting of comportment. Yeah. Uh, and you can see that, you know, when you encounter people, um, uh, I, can, I, I can think of some spiritual women in, in my family, for instance, who had precisely this kind of generous, luminous uh, presence. Yeah. Um, so, I, I, you know, that, that's, that, that's the kind of sense it makes to me, this kind of sculpting of comportment, yeah, which is uh, simultaneously ethical and spiritual and uh, bodily, yeah. So um, that's kind of what uh, I was, uh, I got out of it. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I mean, uh, I think, um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I would, uh, I would say there is, uh, I mean, what you mentioned in terms of um, two Sufis meeting and 
not um, saying anything but understanding each other. Um, I mean, I, I didn't even touch on the um, discussions of firasa, which are, you know, about interpreting um, the body or the face um, and uh, just sort of, un, um, and this sort of tells you that um, there is this um, important place for the body, even if it is sort of a, um, so, uh, sometimes depicted as a tool or a, even uh, just as an inanimate thing um, in, in some cases at the same time um, there are other traditions within the Islamic world that are um, prioritizing or um, have this um, emphasis on, on the, um, the body as that thing which expresses uh, attributes and um, even if I mean, even in the discussion, in the sort of um, quote from uh, Shibli, uh, even if it is a light, well, I mean, I guess it's difficult for for us as you know historians to say, well, what does that what does that mean? Which is why I sort of um, turn to Al Ghazali, who discusses these facial um, um, uh, characteristics. Um, so moving from the body, from the limbs to the face, um, and um, emphasizing. Um, the, the face as the place where um, refined emotions are uh, expressed, for example. Um, so yeah, I mean, yeah, um, mm. thanks for your comments. I mean, it's a lot to think about, yeah. Right, the other thing uh, that I wanted to ask was, so in terms of these um, differences of opinion uh, about, uh, about the proper manifestation or the proper comportment um, of uh, emotion, etc. What do the what did they uh, what what did these differences of opinion have to do with different contexts? Did mm. they? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it was uh, thanks. Uh, that's uh, something I would have loved to go into in the talk, but um, didn't really have the time. So, as I mentioned uh, in Sohrawardi's case, or Mara Sohrawardi's case. Um, there was a uh, an obvious attempt to um, expand the Sufi network um, to um, and there was a close um, so the um, the caliph at the time uh, the Abbasid caliph at the time had um, made himself the head of the Futua organization in Baghdad uh, and that was attached to um, uh, that was also had strong links to the Sufi um, Sufi community at the time. And um, there was an attempt to um, get the wider network of emirates, uh, um, like of Saljuk emirates that were surrounding Baghdad at the time. Um, and so around, this is in the 13th, uh, 12th, 13th century, oh. to um, within the orbit of um, the caliph's influence. So there was a clear um, reason as to why it was easy to, um, uh, to uh, get uh, affiliation to um, uh, the Sohrawardi's uh, so community at the time, um, and that um, and that uh, situation obviously, uh, so Sohrawardi allowed more um, lay people to sort of imitate um, this idea of tashabbuh was not. Um, I mean, it was not was it was never really universally a bad thing, but I mean, it was contested. But Omar Sohrawardi was very lenient. About uh, about that, and even I was um, um, I said that this was something good. Um, and actually, the, Kub the Kubru Kubrawi Sufis were uncomfortable with this. Um, uh, so uh, Majidi and Baghdadi um, makes references to this and and says, "Well, we don't do that. Um, we believe that um, someone has to achieve the spiritual um, position first, and then can." Um, behave like a Sufi or and then can wear what Sufi wears uh, and so you have this um, prioritization which is very interesting as well because I mean it's like even um, scholars of the body and emotion um, discuss this like whether emotions are um, trained bodily trained and um, uh, people sort of are, learn how to um, express these uh, things or whether they are like some sort of internal innate thing um, and you can see that Sufis are engaging with the same questions um, and um, in the case of the Kubrawiya the reason um, 
one of the reasons was that the relationship with the um, rulers and the patronage relations were much much more fraught. So um, the Khawarij and Shahs were um, there was a lot of infighting within the court of the Khawarij and Shahs. Um, the queen mother and uh, and her son didn't really see eye to eye. Um, uh, and uh, uh, the Shah, the Shah at the time, Ala Adin Takesh, um, uh, eventually, um, uh, uh, eventually um, killed Majdudin al Baghdadi um, for being too close to the Queen Mother's court. Um, so um, yeah, so there are a lot of reasons. There are a lot of social, socio-historical reasons um, that come into play. Um, but also, um, I guess. I don't want to say that you know they're purely for these political reasons that this happened. I mean, I think you also have Sufis responding to um, popular practice that, um, and they're um, responding to what the communities around them are doing. Yeah. All right, thank you, Sajad. So yeah, so I mean, picking up on that kind of that last point, it's about. Um, you know, you talked about um, how these affective states are collectively practiced and and as opposed to kind of a top-down approach to Sufism, you know, which privileges, for example, philosophical ideas or metaphysical ideas, um, you know, an affective approach is, is one way of looking at things, you know, from below, so to speak. Um, and, and, you just, and you did mention this question of how the other because that's, I mean, I guess that's the, the sort of the key word in everything we've been discussing is this whole question of other, right? Um, how that maybe um, emerges and, and responds to popular practices. So, um, I, I mean, is there an example of that particular thing? You know, so of, of um, Kobrawis in particular taking up a particular popular practice, gesture, expression of an effective state and saying, yeah, this is the really good way of doing things. We should adopt it. We should disseminate it. Um, so, so that's, I guess, one question. Um, and, um, and, and maybe the other one is, is then to kind of uh, think about how we, how we maybe extend uh, it. So, you know, we've been talking primarily about Kobrawi context and, and their background in, in more classical um, Sufi works and the Sufi manuals in particular, but um, um, you know, thinking again of the popular uh, without that falling into the classic, you know, popular versus learned <laughs> dichotomy. Um, I mean, can you think of other kinds of examples that you might find in in various sorts of Sufi contexts? I mean, I, I'm thinking about there's lots of things which happen, for example, in Pakistan at uh, Sufi shrines. Uh, which are very strong um, um, affective states, which are reflected in all sorts of ways. I mean, we talked about you talked about ecstasy and, and dance, but um, you know, there's that. I mean, the tamal, for example, is a very common expression, arguably, of ecstasy uh, within a, a Pakistani Sufi context and South Asian Sufi context. Um, but there are also ways in which it can be very controlled and sort of top down as well um, so there's you know a, a free-flowing approach to it and there could be more of a controlled approach to it in the same way that you know even in the mevlevi context there's a very controlled approach to the the sama and the and the rats and there is perhaps a more uh, freestyle um you know the state taking you so yeah i guess kind of two related questions about how um, how do we really make sense of, of practice and then how it's disseminated and taken up by by theoreticians perhaps no thank you um those are two yeah a lot a lot to, uh, two really great questions and a lot to sort of yeah how, how can i answer them um yeah so with the first question um are there examples of um Kobru is identifying. Uh, I think you know, there are definitely examples of um, Kobru is identifying certain trends or or um, attaching themselves to certain traditions and um, sticking with them. But I, I, uh, 
I don't know if um, we could say that they stick, they stick to certain, um, well, actually, yeah, they do stick to certain affective um, dispositions. So, um, for example, um, um, they have an intense focus on dhikr rather than sama, right? So, um, I mean, as which I mentioned, so, um, Again, they they sort of they don't focus too much on on wedged, um, and instead focus on the states that are associated with dhikr. And um, this, so often they'll be talking about uh, like um, God's aspects of Jalal and Jamal. Um, Kubra's Fawa'ah is called Fawa'ah uh, His main you know work is called Fawa'ah al Jamal or Fawatah al Jalal. Um, and so. Um, it's really these two um, states almost because, I mean, I guess the uh, the human side of that would be awe and um, sort of contentment or awe and um, sort of God's uh, awe and God's majesty and sort of um, love and contentment in, in his beauty. So um, there's, there is an emphasis on that um, because it's, it lends itself uh, to, to the care. Um, and, uh, again, with all the um, the focus on dream interpretation, and um, it's it's quite striking how you know in in very earlier in earlier texts um, you might not necessarily have the dreamer's affective state being recounted to the dream interpreter, um, uh, but um, in Kubrawi texts it's 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 almost um, you know it's almost universal. I would say that the the affective state of the dreamer is, is mentioned to um, the uh, uh, the interpreter, and that's a sort of practice, right? That's a, um, it's a sort of dreaming practice which comes about through the kid. But also, um, you know, in in their um, uh, in other terminology, so for example, they don't focus on um, baka very much, uh, but uh, the, the term, uh, so you know, fana and baka, so annihilation, and then. A subsistence within God. Um, instead, they they have this concept of a, a continual um, journey, um, and they and they focus on sayr and tayr, and they say you know sayr is um, uh, uh, which is is the bodily um, is the more bodily. Um, I mean, they're both bodily in a way, but it's the more sort of ascetic, um, uh, world renouncing. And um, early part of the, the st of the Sufi path, and Tayr is infinite, and infinite joy in, in God's beauty and and, and infinite experiences in, in God's majesty, and that's very much associated with visions as well. So again, by um, focusing on on different um, terms within the Sufi lexicon, you get these distinctions, um, and um, uh, again, those are those also have uh, institutional. Um, reasons. So um, dream interpretation centralizes the community around um, the master um, and um, the concepts of Sayyid and Tayyid also um, um, have these ideas that you don't really finish the Sufi path, but you're always continually doing it. And that also has implications for the institutional manifestations. Um, with regards to um, free-flowing approach versus um, controlled approach. Well, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I, I understand um, what you're referring to. Um, and even in, within these Sufi texts, you get these, sometimes you read them and, and you think, oh, this is really controlled, you know, <laughs> you see this colored light and at this stage and it must be like that. But I'm sure um, also, you know, uh, these things can also be hegemonic, right? So, I mean, um, you know, um, uh, I guess in South Asia, Kawali, for example, like um, could be an example of a, a sort of practice that is devotional, but also popular. Um, uh, and um, uh, interestingly, you, you get these, um, uh, you get these, um, like within Sufi texts themselves, there are poems that are meant to be that are meant to affect affect, affect you um, while you read because they're also devotional texts many much of the time and um, there are sayings like um, I think 
there's a saying in, in Medjidin Baghdadi, which he recounts, um, and I, I'm not sure where he gets it from now, but he says, uh, in, there's a, there's a, uh, he says, in my heart, there is a qawwal, a singer who sings to me. Um, uh, and so, yeah, I think there is, but I think this sort of tension between the institutionalized forms and the popular forms always exists. And I think um, uh, it's it's not always attention, and sometimes it's accommodated, and sometimes it's um, adopted but diminished, like we saw with the um, dancing and the uh, and the more extravagant examples of wedged. Uh, and these are, I guess, strategies that are continually sort of used and then and change uh, depending on 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 yeah on the context. But do you actually have um, kind of theorizations of this stuff? I mean, like, you know, if if we if we think of uh, even more kind of um, outlandish stuff, you know, kind of like um, piercing yourself with 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 sort of knives and stuff, or, or cutting the self, or um, uh, you know, very sort of radically antinomian perhaps practices. Um, I mean, I, I guess you might have that in some of the sort of Kalandari um, literature, but um, does it does it come up in any other kinds of works on on the kind of the the other of of kind of comportment and and how the adept should should behave and be? Um, is there a space for that, or is that unspoken quite simply because it's it's an element of ecstasy which which is not bound in that particular way? Hmm. Um, yeah, I, uh, I mean, I can think of all sorts of justifications of practically anything, right, that happens, but, but that might be kind of my modern sensibility of saying, well, okay, I think I've read enough Sufi works to write Sufi pastiches, um, but, um, um, but I'm just wondering if there is some sort of history of that happening as well, um, because obviously some elements we do have, like, so, so, Again, in a South Asian context, you know, when it comes to tantric and yogic practices, I mean, we know those are extensively adopted in, among Sufis, and we have texts which describe precisely those, you know, whether it's the kind mm -hmm. of the hanging upside down in the well kind of stuff, right? So that is extensively discussed. Um, but I'm just wondering about some of the other elements, which are a bit more difficult to um, to make sense of, not least because in some ways there is that, I mean, there's that very important element of the spectacle, right? So if, if we're thinking about, you know, Sufis as a community, as a wider community, which is, you know, trying to communicate not just to themselves, but, you know, those beyond them, uh, which I think was certainly happening in Baghdad and Khorasan and many other places, um, then that element of the spectacle is quite important in and of itself. Um, there is something being communicated through that spectacle. There, there is a certain, uh, you know, um, cultivation of other happening through that. Mm. So, yeah, I, I'm just wondering if. No, uh, sure. Um, I mean, that's not. Um... Okay, I guess the um, the it's it's not. Um, I mean, it's it, it, it's not uh, hidden in these. I mean, you you can find um, texts that discuss more antinomian behaviors. Um, of like, for example, Abu Said ibn Abi al Khair. Um, the hagiographical work that focuses on him, written by Ibn al Munawar. Um, is full of um, uh, spectacle, it's full of um, um, miracles, um, clairvoyance, um, uh, you know, scenes that are potentially subversive. So from um, uh, uh, ascetic scenes or homoerotic scenes or, or things like this. Um, uh, and um, but I guess often they're sort of um, tempered or sort of um, 
the author will sort of um, put them in a framework where they're no longer subversive in a way, diminish the, the, the capacity to, to subvert, for example. Um, uh, and um, I mean, one of the um, things with Abu Sayyid and Abu Khair, for example, is that he held a lot of banquets and liked to eat and liked to have a lot of sweets uh, around, <laughs> so which was um, not what Sufis were expected to do. Um, and um, often in these banquets, um, you know, um, these scenes would take place, like um, um, he would be, uh, he would uh, perhaps be rude to someone or perhaps, um, you know, this is where um, some sort of uh, learning would happen um, because the Sheikh would teach, but through a, in a very sort of uh, subversive way. Um, but um, often once um, the author sort of explains something that like this is happening because of the clairvoyance of the sheikh, because the sheikh knew that doing this would um, result in the disciples learning something, uh, right? So you, you, you're totally right in saying that there's um, uh, cultivation of adab in these, in these sorts of um, environments as well. Um, but then do we, I mean, it's difficult to know, I guess, um, just uh, to, to, to really say that these weren't subversive or whether, I mean, all the, that, that, any, that if these behaviors were to happen at any point, that they wouldn't be um, subversive. Um, with respect to Qalandaris, and um, so um, I think uh, scholarship, uh, I, I'm working on the period at which, you know, um, sort of pre-tariqa, pre-emergence of self, consciously identifying tariqas um, and um, but uh, at times where Sufi communities were definitely being in, uh, be becoming more institutionalized and I guess a lot of scholarship now is pointing to the fact that um, the emergence of Qalandariya uh, and uh, Haidaris and other more antinomian groups was because these groups were not able to um, find expression within Sufi communities anymore because they were becoming more institutionalized. And so you had shrine communities popping up or uh, communities popping up around graveyards in, in other um, uh, uh, places that weren't affiliated to um, official um, khanakas that were being uh, patronized by rulers and um, wealthy people. So, um, there's clearly an interaction there in the sense that, you know, um, I guess to, uh, to what extent, like, does institutionalizing the Sufi community and um, uh, denouncing certain practices um, create a sort of backlash um, in, in, in popular devotion and popular uh, piety, which is what seems to have um, been the case. Um, but I, um, you know, um, in terms of the theorizing of, of what the Qalandariya were doing, uh, we don't have um, their texts. We just have what people writing about them and they're often polemical. So, so I mean, it's difficult to say, but um, we, we can definitely see within Sufi texts that um, subversive behavior is at times um, tolerated, but often tolerated because it's been diminished and often tolerated because they've placed it in a sort of lower rank of spiritual behavior. Another example is um, majloops, like um, uh, people who are just attracted to, um, uh, like God has chosen them and they, um, um, they can be like holy fool figures as well and do subversive things. Um, but um, in, these, in these texts, in the sort of 12th, 13th centuries, a lot of uh, a lot of texts are saying, well, that's fine, but they can't teach people because they don't know what it's like to um, uh, go through the training and therefore they can't instruct um, further disciples. Um, and um, you get that also in uh, dream texts. So in some texts, um, one of the dreamers uh, says, I learned some X, Y, Z from uh, a jinn and um, uh, the sheikh tells them, well, you can't 
learn from jinn because they don't have um, human bodies like we do. So, <laughs> um, so um, uh, yeah, you're getting these um, discussions which are trying to circumvent um, the authority of the uh, Sufi Hanka being undermined by other uh, forms of piety. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I was just going to say that, you know, obviously, um, once, once subvertive, um, subversive actions and gestures and practices become institutionalized, of course, they're no longer subversive, right? So <laughs> whether that's through some sort of co-option within hierarchy, as you mentioned, um, or otherwise, um, that's an interesting one. But of course, it still begs the question of, well, why do do some things actually remain subversive? Um, you know, is it the fact that they actually have been co-opted or is it the fact that they still have some sort of communal meaning, uh, which is beyond, um, you know, sort of tariqa hierarchies? Um, so I, I kind of wonder, and, and um, yeah, I mean, I think of like, you know, Dockdale's work, obviously Karl Mustafa's work earlier on, on, you know, kind of wise fools and, um, you know, unruly, God's unruly friends, as Karl Mustafa puts it famously. Um, and of course, there's many examples of that. I mean, there's, I think, a growing literature actually now in the Falandaris across the Persian world, um, which would be useful for that as well. Um, can I can I just bring us this question, which seems to come up from the from Facebook, um, which is in the chat here, just because it, it it's somewhat fundamental, but it'd be useful to know what you think of it. And so this is from uh, Mona Bulgarami. It's um, how does using the I assume that's anthropological concept of affect versus the more prosaic terms of emotion feeling benefit to decolonial gaze upon embodied experiences among Sufis? Um, how does it play into the subjective objective notions of spiritual exper experiences? Hmm. Yeah, um, it's a good, uh, yeah, good question. Uh, I, I don't think, I, I'm not distinguishing necessarily affect um, as in, like, um, I guess I haven't really, um, when I was talking, I wasn't, um, in my head, I didn't have a very clear distinction between affect um, and uh, what I was referring to as emotions um, uh, and, and feelings. Um, but I, um, uh, so, you know, I probably wasn't choosing my words super carefully, but uh, uh, I, the, I think the focus on um, uh, emotions, the history of emotions is to um, understand that, um, and by applying it to Sufism is to um, helps us, as I said, uh, understand the ways in which um, uh, emotions and, and the body um, have a history uh, and the ways in which um, uh, we can engage with um, Sufi texts, as I said, beyond what we've received in terms of um, I mean, the scholarly emphasis on, for example, uh, Sufism as a sort of abstract philosophical or mystical system of thought that is often detached from its historical and institutional realities. Um, uh, and that's not to say that those works aren't useful, they are very useful, but um, uh, I think, um, uh, in much of these um, works in the past, or in a lot of the Orientalist discourse of Sufism, on Sufism in the past, um, we haven't had a full sort of um, a fuller account of um, what this meant for the cultural and social and um, uh, uh, political history of um, of um, Sufism in the past. And, um, uh, you know, um, in a way, we've sort of reimposed a sort of mm, mm, um, almost, um, I don't say like, uh, sort of mind-body split on 
our pro through in in terms of the lens in which we use to approach um, the study of of Islamic mysticism um, in general. Um, and um, yeah, so that's how I I see it as um, uh, uh, sort of reassessing um, uh, Sufism. I mean, I, I was just gonna, sorry. Do one just to follow up on that. Um, I was going to actually ask you this question about feigning other, but let's let's leave that uh, or feigning uh, emotion. But I mean, picking up on 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 the second question that she asked. I mean, um, you, you know, there's this very sterile debate in the philosophy of mysticism about whether mystical experiences or ecstasies is real or whether it's constructed. Right, mm -hmm. but maybe that's kind of what the indication is here. I mean, it's not a terribly useful discussion at all. Um, it was, yeah, exactly. It help you make sense of anything. Um, but and also, what it it actually um, ignores is that there is an extensive Sufi literature, which you know gives a rationale for these things, and and not even not just a Sufi literature. I mean, I'm thinking of the. I mean, to bring up another controversy, um, you know, it's been seen as. Um, discussion, particularly in the Ishadat, about the reality of mystical states and the states of the Orafa, and then the later commentaries on that. I mean, that's a very serious kind of um, philosophical account being given for things like ecstasy. Um, so, um, you know, there, there's that element which is perhaps um, also missing um, uh, within, within some of the literature, precisely because you know, Avicenna is seen as this, it's, it's this classic Sufism versus philosophy that you mentioned earlier. Uh, because he's seen as a philosopher, that element of his thought is completely ignored. Uh, you know, what he has to say about, about the states of the Orafa. Um, anyway, that was just a, a small point uh, just to pick up there. No, yeah, I mean, it's totally, totally right. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's... Uh... Yeah, the, the whether it's uh, subjective, objective is feigned. Um, it's almost like um, Sufis themselves were saying that it's sort of besides the point. <laughs> like, but it's just about how do you like how do you manage this? Essentially, they were trying to manage it from a very early stage, actually. In terms of the uh, connotations of the two words. Uh, um affect clearly uh, sort of has more of a connotation of being uh, deliberate. That's why we also say affected, uh, mm -hmm. for example. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's more of a practice. It uh, indicates more of a practice than emotion does. So um, I think it has that advantage. Uh, obviously, both are English terms and you know, mm -hmm. uh, don't necessarily have much to do, but in terms of expression. But I wanted to ask you um, a couple of uh, other things. Um, so on the one hand, you know, I was thinking, especially when you mentioned the Kavali. Uh, so one of my favorite Kavalis, uh, in it, he he's praising the, you know, his master and, um, or the Waliullah or the saint. It could be Nizamuddin Aliya, it could be the prophet, it could be you know how uh, uh, these Kavalis work. And he says, within every gesture, yeah, um, har, harik ada, so the word they use is ada. Uh, in every, uh, uh, I think gesture is perfectly adequate. By the way, what's the word for gesture? I'll ask you that as well uh, in, uh, in Arabic. I'm asking you. Oh, um... Well, I, I I wasn't applying an, an Arabic term to uh, to the study in terms of uh, like I, I wasn't thinking of translating it. <laughs> but there is a I mean in yeah. in in Urdu there is a very much a word for gesture and ada and in this uh, oh right okay yeah, yeah yeah in in every gesture uh, uh, you give saw saw meaning as much as a hundred or even more. Uh, uh, indications, ishare, yeah, so ishara, as you, uh, which is of, obviously of uh, Arabic origin. Um, so you give a hundreds of indi uh, virtually hundreds of indications, yeah, uh, are given in a single gesture. Yeah, so um, so the gesture appears as very very dense, um, you know, highly uh, highly sculpted, yeah. 
I mean, the fact of the matter is that even in, uh, you know, there is a certain, there are all these gestures and comportments that are associated, for instance, with academic uh, scholarly presentation, uh, um, scholarly comportment. Yeah. But uh, of course, we never talk about it. Yeah. Uh, nor is there any, um, you know, like a science uh, of comportment. Yeah. A science of comportment. Uh, living science of comportment that we have uh, within the uh, academy. It's something that you know, we each acquire. And of course, in different academic communities, there are different gestures, different comportments, uh, slightly, you know, some variation uh, in different environments. Um, but it's, it's very, very important. But we don't have a vocabulary of talking about it. So I think, um, you know, I, and they are, of course, those gestures, comportments also indicate, serve to indicate um, an academic or a scholarly sensibility. Yeah. Um, so I think um, in Sufism, it's just uh, a lot more developed. And the fact of the matter is that gestures, comportments have a profound pedagogical and ethical uh, impact as well, perhaps more even. Yeah, well, uh, I think just like ethical actions have a greater impact uh, pedagogically, so uh, gestures are, of course, and comportments are also actions. Um, so uh, they, they also have a profound pedagogical and ethical impact and significance. Um, and I think that's something that we can take away in terms of, a, you know, our decolonial uh, Islamic spiritualities from, uh, from, this, uh, from this session. By the way, it also goes back. I mean, I was thinking also, uh, 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 you know, Aristotle uh, in the Nicomachean Ethics, he says, you know, it's not a question of whether you're going to get angry or not. It's a question of how angry you're going to get in what measure, it, uh, for how long. So emotions are clearly something. Uh, it's really modern emotivism, which, of course, McIntyre also criticizes uh, at length. Modern emotivism that has resulted in this um, concept or ideology uh, of emotions as being involuntary. And uh, I mean, for Aristotle, they're clearly absolutely essential in the formation or the cultivation uh, of uh, an ethical sensibility. Yeah. No, yeah. Um... Yeah, uh, sorry, I didn't realize you were asking me about uh, when you asked me. I, I guess. Um, I would have just said Ishara, but I maybe I've been reading too much Sufism. But maybe you could say in modern Arabic something like a haraka, but that should just that would just be movement or something. Um, but yeah, I uh, um, it's a uh, certainly um, yeah in terms of uh, gesture and emotion. I mean, I think every every. Um, in academic institution, I mean, academic institutions have their own um, uh, uh, norms, right? So, um, and uh, yeah, and uh, across different cultures as well. Um, I guess uh, it's also, um, yeah, uh, a focus on, on uh, yeah, on, um, Pedagogy, as you say, um, that is, um, uh, yeah, that is uh, very much uh, complex and uh, as in like Sufi discussions of, of uh, training are, um, involve uh, both uh, bodily in instructions, um, but also a, a lot of the um, theoretical discussions um and um a lot of these bodily uh, instructions whether they're aesthetic or um just simply like usual like as um very common Muslim islamic practices like fasting uh, are accompanied by these um theoretical um uh yeah these theoretical notions and these theoretical discussions um and um, I think, yeah, the, you, looking at different uh, these training manuals, for example, is is a, an interesting way to explore that. 
um, and looking at texts that that haven't really um, been. So I mean, I uh, I've been using very well known known texts. Um, they're not necessarily they're, they're very canonical considered canonical texts and and Sufism and um, really it's only towards the end of the presentation where I brought in Kubrawi texts but I mean there's so much material there in terms of um, um, uh, emotions and in terms of um, bodily gestures and and their place in Sufism and, and how they should be practiced that hasn't really been studied as far as I know so yeah there's a lot there's a very rich um, there's rich material out there um, yeah Okay, well, there's a lot more to talk about, but Sajad, I think uh, it's still. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, we should let uh, Iyad off the hook um, yeah. and, 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 and the viewers as well. Um, so um, we, we will um, actually have in, in a couple of weeks um, Iyad's colleague, uh, Janita Karich, who will be talking in our last um, seminar of the year. Uh, but that just uh, leaves it to me to thank everyone for, for watching um, and of course especially thank Iyad for his presentation and uh, for really uh, you know triggering I think a very important uh, uh, conversation so thank you again Iyad and hope to see you so much. soon. Thank you very much for having me it was great. Okay take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.